Okay, so now we're on to Unit 1, Part 3 of Psychology as a Science. Now, what I wanted to discuss is different types of research that are common in psychology. And in reality, there really are three broad umbrellas under which most research falls. The first is called descriptive research, which is basically research on how things are. So if you were to do a study where you wanted to see in a particular population what's the average self-esteem, that would be descriptive research. And a good example of that is a book by a French author from the 1800s called, his name was Quetelet, and the book is called The Average Man, in which he went around and he took measurements of almost anything you could imagine about a human being and um, came up with statistics that described what the average person is like. And so um, arm length, uh, you know, head circumference, all of these variables. And it was one of the first um, uses of statistics in the history of science in this way. The second kind of research is called relational research, which is about how things are in relation to other things. Uh, this is also known as correlational research. And the reason it's called that is that it often uses a statistical technique called correlation, uh, which studies the correlation between two variables. So in the last um, set of slides, I talked about the relationship between ice cream sales and the crime rate. And that would be a good example of relational research, where you're studying the relation between variable X, which is the ice cream sales, and variable Y, which is the crime rate. And so there are a lot of things that you could study using correlation. You could study someone's income and compare it to how open they are to new experiences. Or you could study how satisfied people are with their marriage and how satisfied they are with their job. The idea being that maybe there's a relationship between satisfaction such that the less satisfied you are with your marriage, the less satisfied you are with your job, and the more satisfied with your marriage, the more satisfied with your job. It could be the opposite way, where the more satisfied you are with your marriage, the less satisfied you are with your job. But the idea is this, with relational research, you're looking at the relation between variables, but these are variables that are not assigned experimentally. And that's the other class of research, experimental research. And um, in experimental research, the major difference between experimental and relational research is that experiments always randomly assign people into different groups. Often we call these groups conditions. But the idea is that you have, say, a drug, and you want to see if the drug is effective. What you do is that you randomly divide people into two groups, one group who gets the drug and one group who doesn't get the drug, and you see at the end of uh, a period of time whether or not those that didn't take the drug show any difference in whatever it is that your outcome variable is uh, than those that did take the drug. So you're comparing those that didn't take the drug and those that did and seeing if there is a difference after a period of time that they've taken the drug. That's an example of an experiment. And, of course, not all experiments have to do with drugs. One could, you know, do a study in which you randomly assign people to taking this class in this online way or taking it in the more traditional in-class way and studying whether or not outcomes, which is measured by the grade that people get at the end of the class, differ between those that took it online and those that took it in class. That would be a perfectly good experiment. And the one thing that's really good about experiments is that it allows us to determine causes. If you remember from the last set of slides, I talked at length about causality and how one of the holy grails of research is to determine causality, what causes what to occur. And what is good about experiments is that they allow you to identify causality. Because in the case of the drug trial, I, because I randomly assigned people in the two different groups, the really the only thing that's different between those two groups is going to be 
whether or not the one group took the drug and the other one didn't. Okay? Whereas if I were to, to do an experiment in a relational research design where people come to the lab and I ask them, do you take this drug? And then I measure whatever the outcome variable might be. Let's say it's happiness. Uh, you know, it may be the case that people who are more happy are more likely to take the drug rather than the drug making people happy. So with relational research, it's really hard to get at causes. But with experimental research, it's much more easy to assign causes to particular things. Now, again, as I said in the last set of slides, you can't always do experiments. I can't randomly assign children into a group in which they're abused and into a group in which they're treated really kindly by their parents because there's no way I can ethically force parents to abuse their kids. That would be wrong on, a, on so many levels and illegal and, you know, it just, you couldn't do that kind of experiment. So there are certain things you just cannot study experimentally that you have to study in a relational fashion. And so, you know, a lot of this course is going to be focusing on these two aspects of research design. Now, we talked also in the last you know, set of slides on theories and laws. And so I just want to point out again and reiterate what this is about. A theory is a statement about the relationship among a set of variables that often contains at least one indirect concept needed to explain the relationship. Okay, so what theories do is they explain relationships among variables and that becomes really important if you're trying to build a theory. Now there's two things that I'll be talking about a lot in this class which are theoretical constructs and empirical constructs. Theoretical constructs are entities that are identified by an experimenter or by a researcher that they aim to study. So these are broad categories of things. They are not specific measuring tools. Okay, so I might be interested in one's attention span, or I might be influenced on obesity, or something like spatial reasoning. Yet those terms are so broad that they're almost meaningless because attention span could mean many different things. So what we need to do is identify empirical constructs, which are tools that we design to measure a theoretical construct. So for instance, a particular empirical construct for attention span might be the number of times that someone looks away from an object, with the idea being that the more that people look away from an object, the less attention that they're giving to that object. Uh, for obesity, I might use something which is called body mass index, which is a measurement which takes into account your height and your weight. And for spatial reasoning, I might be interested in one's ability to rotate three-dimensional figures in memory. So imagine I show you two figures of uh, sets of blocks that are rotated at different angles. Uh, I might ask people, uh, are they the same set of blocks or a different set of blocks? And that might require them to rotate that figure in their memory. And that could be the amount of time that it takes them to do that. And how accurately do that could be my empirical construct for measuring spatial reasoning. Okay, so when I teach this, I often tell students that our theoretical construct is almost like a cloud. And because it's very sort of nebulous and it's up there in the sky. And what we are doing as researchers is that we're holding a spotlight. And what we're trying to do is illuminate as much as that s cloud as possible that's up there. And we do that by trying to sort of focus our spotlight onto the cloud and trying to, you know, not, uh, you know, sample many clouds, but only get one cloud. And that's what I think a, a good idea of what a theoretical and an empirical construct is. So, as I said, when we talk about theories, we're talking about a statement about the relationship among a set of variables that contains at least one indirect concept needed to explain the relationship. So, imagine that I have a theoretical construct which I identify as excessive drinking. Uh, there's a lot of research showing that excessive drinking has lots of consequences on both health and psychological behavior. And I'm going to say that my measure of someone 
drinking excessively is if they consume more than 25 drinks per week. Okay. Now, I arbitrarily chose that number. One could say that 15 is the limit, or you could say 45 is the limit. But you have to start somewhere. And so for the purpose of identifying excessive drinking, I'm going to say that if a person has more than 25 drinks per week, uh, which is basically about four drinks a day, uh, that that's considered excessive. Okay. And so what we do in building a theory is we identify an indirect concept. So we might have an idea that excessive drinking causes frontal lobe damage. Now, Frontal lobe damage is something that's kind of hard to come up with an empirical construct for. How do I measure frontal lobe damage when that damage might be microscopic, when it's very difficult to open up someone's brain and look in at the neurons and see, you know, what's going on? Uh, that's kind of not ethical. And uh, so that's kind of the indirect concept that is hard to come up with an empirical construct for. But then you have its relation to variable two which is memory loss. And you might know from other research that frontal lobe damage, people that have been in car accidents, for instance, they have problems with memory. And so maybe it's the case that excessive drinking causes the same kind of damage to the frontal lobe as would an accident. And um, that leads to memory loss. Now, that's my theoretical construct, but my empirical construct for memory loss is poor performance in a digit span test. That's when you give people an increasing number of digits, being numbers like 5, 4, 6, 7, 2, and you ask people to repeat them. You eventually get to a point in which people are not able to remember the digits, and the idea here would be people who are excessive drinkers are likely to have poorer performance in the digit span test than those that do not excessively drink. And this is how we build a theory. It's this relationship between variable 1 and variable 2, and we build this by identifying theoretical constructs, which we measure using empirical constructs. Now, one aspect of theories that is important is they must be falsifiable. Okay, they must be able to be disproven. And this goes back to what I spoke about earlier, about being able to observe things. Okay, I can't disprove a theory that 25 angels can dance on the head of a pin because I can't observe that. So in order to be able to have a theory, it must be falsifiable. Now, it may be possible that there really isn't a relationship between excessive drinking and memory loss. Maybe there are other consequences of uh, excessive drinking, you know, personality changes, um, you know, other kinds of health consequences, but not memory. In which case, if we identified those who drink excessively and those that don't, and we find that they have the same digit span, then we can say that there's just not enough evidence to, you know, prove the theory that there's a relationship between excess of drinking and memory loss. So theories have to be set up in a way in which they are falsifiable. And that's really what hypotheses are. Hypotheses are theories that we assume to be true for the purpose of testing. Now, some important aspects of theories. They organize knowledge and explain laws. They predict new laws. And they guide new research. And the reason why they have this important function is that, you know, theories really need to be generative. They need to lead somewhere. They need to broaden our understanding of the way in which phenomena work. And in that sense, what theories do is open the door to new ideas and new ways of thinking about things. For instance, in the case of drinking, uh, perhaps one of the important things that could be gained from research on this is to try to convince people that they should drink less or maybe to come up with some kind of an intervention, a drug or otherwise, that would lessen the impact that excessive drinking has on behavior and memory. Uh, and so that's why, you know, theories are important, is that they allow us to come up with new ways of solving problems, and that is a very useful thing. 
As I just mentioned, hypotheses are theories that are assumed to be true for the purpose of testing. Okay, so I might have, here are three examples, I might have a hypothesis that anorexia is caused by social factors such as advertising, cultural values that provo promote extreme thinness, or that infants can discriminate between differences in number of objects. That's a, you know, a research topic that's been important in the history of child cognition is, are infants born being able to understand number, or is that something that they learn? Or finally, priming images of death increases belief in religious dogma. There is a theory out there called terror management theory that has to do with the idea that we, when we are primed with or faced with the idea of death, it changes the degree in which we believe in religious dogma, uh, it changes the way in how nationalistic we are, uh, it has profound influences on our cognition. And so what a hypothesis does is that we just assume this is true and we test it and either the hypothesis is confirmed or there's not enough evidence to confirm the hypothesis, in which case you have to stop there and say, well, there's not enough evidence to prove the hypothesis. Um, and so, in reality, most of psychological research really is organized around testing hypotheses. Whether or not it's explicitly stated in an article or not, it's generally the thing that most research is doing. Um, and an important point to make is that hypotheses really can never be proven. You can only assert the likelihood of alternative hypotheses based on collected data. So what we do when we do research is we, and we'll get into this quite a bit later, uh, we do something called null hypothesis significance testing. So what we have when we do a, re a test a hypothesis is that we start off testing the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that there is no difference between, say, two groups, or there is no relationship between two variables. And that's what we test, okay? And if it's the case that the test shows that there is a difference between two groups or a relationship between two variables, we can reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference between the groups or a relationship between the two variables. And adopt or accept an alternative hypothesis. Now, we'll get into the reason why, but an important point to remember and to know, and when I say remember, I mean remember from when you took statistics for social sciences, is that really the only thing that we can do is test the null hypothesis. It's very difficult to be able to test the alternative hypothesis, but we'll get into more detail about that in a bit. I just wanted to point that out at this point. Finally, I want to talk about the idea that science is really a social construction, okay? It's based on a shared agreement as to what is truth. Um, and so science really is a system of organizing knowledge and a way of approaching problems and organizing conclusions, okay? And because it's a social construction, it suffers from all the failings that all social constructions have to deal with. Um, you know, for instance, what a researcher's agenda might be. Um, what biases might influence the researcher. Is the researcher being funded by a corporation that has an agenda where they want to sell more product? Uh, are there alternative explanations? Um, one thing that I want you to learn from this course is that not all the science that you see out there is valid, useful, real, or even correct. I think that it's important to remember that uh, a lot of science can be can significantly skewed by various forces that, you know, where there's an agenda that, you know, people want to try to convince you of. And so what I really think is most important from this class is not that necessarily you become a really good producer of knowledge, but a good consumer of knowledge, so that you won't make mistakes the next time you see something in the paper saying that, you know, the best way to, you know, get healthy is to drink a gallon of milk in one sitting. You'll realize that a lot of those claims, that's probably funded by 
some milk lobbying organization. So that's part of what we're going to be doing in this course, is kind of learning how to be a good consumer of research.